So I was asked to talk about um, nuclear decision making in South Asia. And before I get to that and explain this picture, which I promised to do in a minute, I wanted to make an observation about uh, one of the comments that was made in the previous panel by um, Kenneth Benedict. She mentioned a group of scientists during the Manhattan Project writing a report about uh, the use of nuclear weapons before the first weapon had actually been built. And this was the Frank Report uh, that came out of a group of uh, Manhattan Project scientists in, in Chicago. And it's largely forgotten as part of the debate, so I was glad that she brought it up. And the reason I wanted to mention it was that it's the first time that I know of in the history of nuclear weapons where people actually talked about what are the conditions for making the decision to use nuclear weapons, other than just the blanket assumption that the President of the United States should be allowed to just go ahead and decide whatever he wants. And so I just wanted to take a minute to tell you how far we have fallen from the kind of thought that went into this and the kind of values that were informing that first debate about what are the conditions under which we could imagine a possible use of nuclear weapons. And this, you have to remember, is during wartime. Not where we are now, but actually during wartime. And so what the scientists who were building the bomb proposed to the US government in a secret report in June of 1945 is that don't just go drop the bomb on a Japanese city. This is not the right thing to do. They also said if you build the bomb, you will trigger an arms race, but that's a separate matter. They were certainly right about that. But what they said was that the United States should think of a policy of demonstrating the new atomic bomb when it was ready. And what they proposed, if you read the report, is that they said we should demonstrate the new bomb before the eyes of the representatives of the United Nations in the desert or on an empty island somewhere. So that not just the Japanese, but the whole world would see what this new weapon that the United States had built, which they knew already was a weapon that was going to be a potential threat to all of civilization, as Henry Stimson told President Truman when Truman was first told about the bomb. Stimson said, this is bomb we are making, will be a threat to all of civilization, and the fate of humanity will be in the balance. So they said, demonstrate it on a barren island and invite the whole United Nations to watch so they will see. And then after such a demonstration, when everybody's seen how terrible this weapon is, that such a weapon could be used against Japan if the permission of the United Nations and of the public opinion at home could be obtained. In other words, the executive authority of the United States should not be able to decide to use the bomb on its own initiative, but only with the consent of the entire international community as organized in the new United Nations and through obtaining the permission of the American people. So you have both domestic democracy having to be consulted and the international community to be consulted and their permission obtained. And that even then, you shouldn't drop the bomb on a city. They said that you should give Japan the ultimatum that they should surrender. And if they won't surrender, tell them to evacuate an area in Japan where we will drop the bomb on some empty area of Japan after all the people have left that space so they will see how terrible it is on their territory. So instead, they went and dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and told the simple lie this was a military base. But this is how far the debate has come. That what we're struggling now about presidential first use, that when we first thought about it, we already had a set of ideas on the table for how to think about the conditions for the use of nuclear weapons. 
that we could only dream about being part of the discussion today. So with that as a kind of historical framework, I wanted to talk about nuclear weapons in South Asia. And the reason for starting with that is that how to think about nuclear weapons and the use of nuclear weapons is a lesson the United States taught everybody else. Because the United States was the first to have to deal with this set of questions. Not only did they build it, they used it. So the discussion of the first use of nuclear weapons, it was first use. The United States was not under imminent threat of attack. They used it anyway. And when the bomb was explained to the world, it was explained as a weapon of awesome power that was harnessing the power of the sun that was going to be the future of warfare. And so no wonder others wanted it and thought, yeah, if the United States can use it and they claim it turns the tide of war, then we want it too. So in South Asia, this lesson has taken root. And India and Pakistan both have nuclear weapons now. And what you see in this picture, which was taken by an astronaut on the space station, the bright yellow line that you see snaking up the middle of the picture is the border between India on this side of the picture and Pakistan on the right-hand side of the picture. And the bright, shiny spot way over there on the right at the bottom is the city of Karachi, which is 20 million people. And just imagine the distance from that city of 20 million people to the border with India. So we did a calculation. How long would it take a missile to fly from an Indian military base to a target in Pakistan and vice versa? And so when Bruce Blair opened our conversation this morning, talking about how many minutes, you know, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, six minutes to decide about this, that, or the other, 300 seconds is what we have for the time of flight of the missile from a base in India to a city of 20 million people in Pakistan. 300 seconds. By the time Pakistan knows or India knows that the missile is coming, the better part of 100 seconds are already gone. So that leaves you 200 seconds to figure out what's happening is it real? What do we do? Who decides? 200 seconds. You can almost hold your breath for that long. And what the Indians and the Pakistanis have done is to try and put in place systems of managing decision-making about nuclear weapons that are completely removed from that reality. So they have on paper these very proper procedures about who will be the members of the committee that will decide. So they have committees on both sides, chaired by prime ministers or their designated appointees with lots of cabinet ministers and generals. And they're supposed to decide collectively as if all of that, you could even get them together or even on the phone in 200 seconds in the middle of the night in a crisis situation. But what they've done is put in place a fantasy decision-making procedure. And in this decision-making procedure, they're called employment committees. Right? The committee to decide the employment of the nuclear weapon. How will it be put to work? And in the Pakistani case, even the fantasy of having a committee chaired by the prime minister that will decide about the use of nuclear weapons, you know, beggars belief. For the simple reason that in any committee where the prime minister of Pakistan and the chief of the army sit at the same table, you know who gets to decide, and it's not the prime minister. Mm -hmm. Pakistan has had three periods of military dictatorship. And it was in those periods of military dictatorship that the nuclear weapons program was born, that the bomb was built, and that we had the first war with India where both sides had nuclear weapons. And the command structure, this fantasy document, was actually put in place. 
And so the Pakistan army is actually used to being in charge on everything that matters when it comes to these kinds of things. And prime ministers know to get out of the way. So even if on paper it says the prime minister will chair the committee, they will look to the chief of army to decide what to do. So he will be in charge, in fact, of everything that matters when it comes to the use of nuclear weapons. And the plan that they have for the use of nuclear weapons is the first use of nuclear weapons as a deliberate strategy. Right? And it's something that they've always had as the basis for their nuclear strategy, that if they are in a war with India, they will turn a conventional war into a nuclear war as soon as they fear that they are losing the conventional war, which they expect to lose. I mean, that's the basis of their planning, that we will begin to lose because the Indians have more soldiers, more tanks, and unless there is international intervention, we have to go nuclear. And the Indian response to this has been, if you use nuclear weapons against our soldiers, anywhere, including on the Indian side of the border, if they're massing to attack, then we will launch massive retaliation. So the Indian policy is that we will not go first, but we will not have proportionate response. Right? It's not that you attack our soldiers, we attack your soldiers. No, you attack our soldiers, we destroy your cities. So I was actually in a debate with an Indian admiral who was in charge of India's nuclear weapons. And so I asked him this question. I said, explain to me. Pakistan uses a nuclear weapon against some Indian soldiers and tanks in the desert because they think they're going to lose the battle here. And you say you're going to have massive retaliation against Pakistani cities. Are you going to kill millions upon millions of civilians because Pakistan kills some soldiers and destroys some tanks? And nuclear weapons are not very good at destroying tanks, by the way. That's why the US had 7,000 tactical weapons in Europe to fight Soviet tanks. You need a lot. And he said, yes, we will destroy Pakistan cities because that's the only way to deter. Not proportionate, but massive retaliation. And the Pakistani generals have their answer to this. You attack our cities, we will use everything we have against your cities. So you can see one, two, three, and it's all over. Where did this insanity come from? The insanity begins, as I said, the United States, when it was trying to recruit allies in the Cold War, tried to get India. And the Indians said no. So they said to the Pakistanis, will you be our ally against the Soviets? And the Pakistanis said, sure, send guns and money, we'll do it. And the US sent both. But the US in the 1950s expected the next war to be a war against the Soviet Union and to go nuclear. So they sent people to the Pakistani military training academies to teach them how to fight nuclear war. And in American military planning for the fighting of the next war, you begin with the use of tactical nuclear weapons against Soviet forces because you think the Soviets will overwhelm you, and nothing has changed. It's just that instead of relying on American nuclear weapons, the Pakistanis built their own to do the same thing based on the lessons that the Americans taught them so long ago about how important nuclear weapons are, how they turn the tide of war, and how you get them to do what you want. And so where we are today in the sense of dealing with this set of decision making is that you have, in fact, the Pakistani military controlling the speed, the pace, and the direction of decision making on the use of nuclear weapons in South Asia. Because whatever the Indians have to deal with, it will be the Pakistanis that instigate this. Because India has overwhelming conventional force and doesn't need to begin, at least in the case of a war with Pakistan, the first use of nuclear weapons. And that is India's stated policy. The Indian military, by and large, doesn't particularly like this idea, by the way. They want to be able to go first. But Indian politicians have held the line at least so far to say, look, you know, we're not going to start by using nuclear weapons. And the modeling of what war looks like in South Asia you know, is gruesome. But it's become pretty obvious that it would involve you know, incredibly large numbers of casualties given the scale of South Asian cities. You know, 20 million people in Karachi, Delhi, Mumbai, etc. You know, you would very quickly, within hours, have killed tens of millions of people. And if the studies, as was mentioned before, about nuclear winter play out, and you burn entire South Asian cities, then there is a, 
the computer models at least suggest that you are in danger of triggering a nuclear winter that lasts two decades and destroys food production across most of the world for two decades, right? And there is worldwide famine and starvation and collapse. But what we need to understand in the context of the discussion that we're having here about you know, the United States and how the United States thinks about nuclear weapons, until this changes, this question of how the United States thinks about and talks about and organizes around the use of nuclear weapons, it's very hard to imagine a debate taking place in any other weapon state about rethinking their nuclear posture or why they need to keep nuclear weapons. The United States has gone around the world for 70 years teaching everybody, as Hugh Gustafson says, those lessons about, look, we are a mature, reasonable, sensible democracy, we are the most powerful country in the world, and to some extent, some of those things have been internalized by the people on the receiving end of this story of American exceptionalism. Right? And you will go talk to people in Pakistan if you're an anti-nuclear activist in Pakistan, or to leaders in India if you're an anti-nuclear activist there, and they will tell you, look, if the Americans think they need nuclear weapons, surely we do. If the Americans think that they need to use nuclear weapons first, then surely we should be able to do so too. And so it's not just Trump and the threat from North Korea or however one wishes to see this, although you know, it's worth keeping in mind that most of this debate is taken on the presumption it's been perfectly fine for the United States to threaten North Korea with nuclear war ever since they actually did during the Korean War, repeatedly, and kill God knows how many Koreans. And yet the first time North Korea says, actually, we may have the capability to threaten you back. Oh, my God, the sky is falling. Right? But the future of nuclear decision making in all the other nuclear weapon states hinges on how the United States begins to think about changing its policy about nuclear weapons. So it's not just US policy that is actually at risk here. You need to actually think about how this intersects with how everybody else can then legitimate or no longer legitimate their policies of the first use of nuclear weapons, of keeping nuclear weapons, and of the question about the elimination of nuclear weapons. Because as we talked about this morning, there is now a new international treaty open for signature and being signed for the prohibition of nuclear weapons that forbids the use of nuclear weapons and the threat of use of nuclear weapons. And this debate about use of nuclear weapons needs to begin with the frame that the threat and use of nuclear weapons would be a crime against humanity and a crime under international law and any policymaker that is willing to take that decision forward of the use of nuclear weapons or the threat of use of nuclear weapons should be considered to be an international war criminal from the get-go. We shouldn't walk backwards into this debate about the presidential use of nuclear weapons. We should go walk forwards in the context that the Ban Treaty has now created. The world believes, by and large, that the use of nuclear weapons is not acceptable. And this debate has to begin from this. Not about limiting the circumstances under which you can use them or who gets to decide, but the fact that any use under any circumstances would be seen as a crime. And so I would urge you to think about how to frame this discussion that we've been having in that context. Thank you.